Can you believe it? The biggest, greatest celebration in American culture is one week from today. That's right. Don't know what it is? I'll give you a second to think about it. If you still haven't figured it out, we'll have to show you a little grace in your house this morning because you don't remember what's coming up a week from today. Okay, here it is. Ready? Mother's Day. That's right. It's Mother's Day one week from today. So for kids, students at home that are watching, even you as parents, dad, looking at you, you got one week, one week to make sure that you show the mom in your house some love and some care on Mother's Day. Now, we want to help you out a little bit, not only show you grace this morning as a reminder, but we want to do something fun. So one week from today, we're going to be showing a video in church that comes from you. That's right. We are starting this week, even starting today, our Mother's Day video challenge. We want to be able to show the moms all over our community and in our church community how much we love them. And so I'm giving you this challenge. If you have a mom at home, make a video showing love to your mom. It could be any type of video. It could have mom in it. You could sing her a song. You could do a TikTok dance. The sky's the limit, all right? There are no boundaries except for the boundary of showing love to your mom and recording it. Once you record that video, send it to me this week via email, kisabelli at ccch.org. And next Sunday during our worship service, we will show the top, the best Mother's Day video. So that's your challenge this week because... We need something extra to do, right, during this time. So show some love to your mom. Make sure that you record it and send it to us, and we'll show that best one next Sunday during our worship service. Now, just want to clarify with this challenge, what I'm not saying is that we should only show love to our moms one day a year. And when we do show that level, we have to make sure the whole world knows about it, right? we got to get on every single social media account we have so that everyone knows how much we love our mom. I'm sure the moms would agree, and I'm sure I can already hear the amens about to come in agreement, that as a mom, you want to be shown loved every single day, right? And even not, not even moms, even just everyone, we want to be shown loved every single day by our people, the people in our family, our friends, our community. We, we want to feel that type of love. And whether it's the love of a hug, that we'll, we'll get back to those soon. We'll be able to hug each other, those that love with physical touch. We're, it's going to happen, don't worry. Or how about those that feel love through acts of service or encouraging words, spending quality time together, receiving gifts. However you feel love, you and I want to be loved on a consistent basis. Now why is it though That we can't just say, I love you, and then do something else. Why is it that we actually have to act on our intent to love someone? Well, it's because love is a verb. Love is something that displays itself in our actions toward someone else. When we act in a loving way towards someone, it reveals our heart's desire towards them. So love has to be something that is done with our actions. And I believe the same is true of our love for Jesus. And so this morning we wrap up our series entitled Last Words of Jesus as we look at the last words Jesus spoke to his disciples before he left and went back to the Father in heaven where he is today. Last week we pressed pause on the conversation that Jesus was having on the beach with his disciples. And he gave them a Mission. In fact, it was a recommissioning of the mission he had for them and for all of us to be fishers of men, to share the hope and the love of Jesus to a world who needs to hear it. And we, we talked specifically last week about, well, we're going to press pause and come back to it next week and talk about the practicality of what this mission looks like. But last week we said, in order for us to be on this mission, we have to be in this relationship and communion and fellowship with Jesus on a consistent basis. So the motivation to be on mission starts from the love we experience from Jesus. So we established that last week. Now this week we're going to look deeper into what does this mission look like on a consistent basis in our life? What does it look like to 
love Jesus in our actions, not just a one time a year thing, not just during a worldwide pandemic, but what does it look like to love Jesus and be on mission with him in every aspect of our life on a consistent basis? So that's where we're heading this morning. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to John chapter 21. That's where the conversation is going to be at with Jesus and his disciples. We're going to start in verse 15 in just a moment. And as you're turning there, just want to remind you that here at CCCH, we teach from the Bible every week because we believe God has primarily spoken to us through his word. And not only do we believe the Bible, God's word is true, but that it's very applicable to our lives today. So we're in John chapter 21, starting in verse 15. We pick up from the conversation last week that Jesus was having with his disciples. And now it focuses specifically on Jesus's one-on-one conversation with Peter, with all the disciples around listening in on what's going on. So verse 15 says this. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Well, Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And so he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. This is actually one of the most talked about conversations about a conversation recorded in the Bible. There's so much written, so many conversations have taken place about Jesus' interaction with Peter. He asked him three different times, do you love me? Peter says, of course I love you, Jesus. I just swam out of a boat to get to shore because I was so excited to see you. And Jesus says, okay, then feed my sheep. And we're going to look at this conversation, but it's very symbolic of not just this one-on-one conversation, but it's symbolic of Jesus' relationship with Peter as a whole. And it's symbolic of our personal relationship that we have with Jesus as well. Now, if you would remember, about a month prior to having this conversation with his disciples, Jesus had his disciples together. And he was telling them that he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to be crucified on a cross, that he's going to die and rise again. And they didn't get it. It kept going over their heads. And it was in one of these conversations a week before Jesus was crucified that he was telling his disciples this. And Peter says, Jesus, no, no, no. No matter what happens to you, I'm going to defend you. No matter where you go, Jesus, I will be there with you. I will always be your right-hand man. I'm always going to be there for you. I'll never deny you. I'll never forsake you. I will always love you. And it's in the context of this conversation that Jesus actually says this to Peter. It's found in John chapter 13, verse 38. Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. The story plays out, maybe you're familiar with it, is that in that 24-hour time span, while Jesus is on trial before his crucifixion, Peter denies ever knowing Jesus three different times. And so in this conversation that Jesus is having with Peter on the beach... Jesus isn't guilt-tripping Peter, saying, hey, remember when you denied me three times? No, no, no. He's forgiving him for each time he denied him. That's why he asked him three different times, do you love me? And it's a reminder for us that no matter what we've done, no matter what our past looks like, Jesus is always willing to forgive us. Because of his great love for us, Jesus is always willing to forgive us. Because of his great love for us, Jesus is always willing to forgive us. Let let, let that sink in for a moment. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, Jesus is always willing to forgive us. Just like he was willing to forgive Peter. And so it's out of Jesus' unconditional love and forgiveness towards Peter that he then gives him this strange request to feed his sheep. 
Now, he's, he's not telling Peter literally, hey, I have these six little lammies over here and I need you to take care of them when I go back to the Father in heaven because those are important lambs. He's not saying that. It's, once again, it's symbolic. Specifically, it's symbolic of the role that Jesus has for Peter and ultimately for all of us to care for those around us, care for those in our community, to be a shepherd to those who are in need. Now, the idea of a shepherd throughout the Bible times is someone who selflessly gives up their life to care for sheep who don't really always know what's going on. Sheep were not the smartest animals. They weren't the brightest animals. And so they needed a lot of extra care. And so the idea of a shepherd is someone who sacrificed their entire life, who selflessly gave up beautiful nights of sleep to stay awake to care for their sheep. In fact, God the Father portrays himself as a shepherd throughout the Old Testament, and Jesus takes on that model of being a shepherd in the New Testament. He refers to himself as the good shepherd. In John chapter 10, verse 11 and 14 and 15, this is what Jesus has to say about himself. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then go down to verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus proves that he's a good shepherd and he loves his sheep by his actions, by giving up his life to die on the cross to take the punishment for our sins, to rise again three days later to overcome the power of sin and death in our lives, to give us a forever relationship with him right now and into eternity. The good shepherd proves his love to his sheep by his actions. And what Jesus is calling Peter to do is to prove his love to Jesus by taking care of Jesus' sheep. Taking care of the people that Jesus loves and gave up his life on the cross for. And that challenge is not only for Peter, but also for those disciples that were sitting there at breakfast that morning. And it's for you and I today as followers of Jesus. But let's talk about this, this love and care for sheep for just a moment. Peter's love for the sheep is not an obligation. But it will be, his love for Jesus will be seen in the way that he loves the sheep. Because of his love from Jesus, he's able to care for the sheep. Not, I care for the sheep and so then I love Jesus. No, no. The, the root, the power, the source of his love for sheep comes from the love that Jesus has for him and his love for Jesus. And I, I think this is why Jesus has to get personal with him here in this text, in this moment. It's because it takes a lot personally to love someone and care for them. Any type of actions that we show towards someone that are loving happen in the context of a personal relationship. And so Jesus has to show Peter how much he loves Peter personally before Peter can get personal with others and show love to others as well. In essence, this conversation, Jesus is not only forgiving Peter, but what he's saying is this, Peter, I love you. I care about you. I gave up my life for you. And even though you hurt me and denied me in a time of need, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to show you that I love you. And now what I want you to do is this. That same love that you've experienced from me, that same love that I know that you have for me, let it be displayed in your love and care for others. Going back to last week, G Jesus reminds Peter and all of us of our mission to, to be fishers of men, to share this love of Jesus. And so our motivation to be a fisherman, to be fishers of men, comes from the fact that Jesus went after us, that Jesus fished for us first. So our motivation to love and to care for others comes from the fact that it comes from Jesus' love and care for us first. And so we have a message of hope and healing that the world so desperately needs, but we can't share that message unless we have experienced hope and healing in our personal relationship with Jesus. We have a message of forgiveness and kindness and empathy that this world desperately needs, but we can't share that unless first we have experienced that kindness and forgiveness and empathy from Jesus himself. As 1 John says, we love 
because he first loved us. We fish for others because we've been fished for. We feed and care for others because we have been fed and been cared for. So our motivation to love, it comes from Jesus. And then our love for Jesus is shown in how we love and care for others. So this isn't a, oh, I have to do this. Because I'm a follower of Jesus, because I'm a Christian, I have to be kind. I have to take care of others. I have to tell people about the difference Jesus has made in my life. Now, this isn't a have to. This isn't an obligation. This is a get to. In fact, this is the greatest privilege. This is the greatest freedom you and I will ever experience on this side of eternity. Think about it in this way. If you're a parent, you have a spouse, maybe this resonates just a little bit more in this example. And this can apply for so many people in any type of personal relationship. But when you have those feelings of of love towards someone, it's easy to, to do that. It's easy to show them that you love them through your actions. But what happens when those feelings of love are gone? What happens when it's 6 o'clock in the morning and they're up way too early for the fourth day in a row and the breakfast that you make them, they want nothing to do with and they throw it on the floor? What happens at 2 o'clock in the afternoon they're throwing a temper tantrum or they're frustrated with their homework because you're not the best homeschool teacher? And what happens when you're having those disagreements at home over the future and finances and what's going to be happening next because you're still furloughed? What, What happens when... Fill in the blank. What happens when you don't feel like loving those people that are around you? Well, you're still able to act in a loving way towards them. Not because you've got to dig down deep and muster up this love that comes from you. You're able to do that because you have received an unconditional love from Jesus that compels you to love, that empowers you to love, that gives you the desire and gives you the reminder that you are called to love and care for your people, care for those that you are in personal relationship with. See, this leads us to our big idea this morning. If there's one thing that we can take away from this, this story from Scripture, if you're taking notes at home, I'd write this down. It's this. Take a screenshot of it as well if you need to. It's that my love for my people points my people to my Jesus. My love for my people points my people to my Jesus. In those situations that I'm experiencing and so many of you are experiencing that I just talked about, where it's really hard to love people around us or people that we interact with on social media, at the end of the day, when we do love them and do care about them, we don't need any credit for it. Because it's not our love that's motivating us. It's not our love and strength that's allowing us to do this. It comes from Jesus himself. You see, my love for my people, whether it's my family, my friends, my community, needs to always point my people to my Jesus. Because my Jesus has changed me because he's loved me and forgiven me, even though I don't deserve it. And now I want others to experience that love and care in their life. It's like the old Christmas carol, be good for goodness sake. That, that's not here. That's not happening. We're not being good for goodness sake. We're being good and showing kindness because there is someone else who is greater than us and and as you know you could say more gooder or more good you throw an er onto whatever word you want to at this point right there's someone who is showing that love and kindness and goodness that we want others to experience and if they get a little glimpse of that and how we act towards them watch out because they can experience even something greater in a personal relationship with jesus and this, is, this has always been God's intention. This has always been God's mission for his people and his church. In fact, in Romans chapter 2, the end of verse 4, Paul writes this. He says, God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. So the idea is that God loves and cares unconditionally for us. And the main purpose of that is for us to turn away from our old way of living, to turn away from our selfishness, to turn away from our sinfulness, make a complete 180 and turn towards God, turn towards loving him, turn towards trusting in him as our Lord and Savior, repenting, turning away from our old way of living and turning towards a life, a new life in relationship with Jesus Christ. 
You see, God loves the world, as John 3.16 says. God loves everyone. But in order to experience that loving, personal relationship that God has for each and every one of us, it has to come by putting our faith and trust in Jesus alone. And so our love, our actions towards the world, towards our community, or towards my people, should point my people to the love they can experience in relationship with Jesus. So I've been so encouraged over this past month of how our church has shown love to those around us, whether it's been writing the 300 encouraging note cards to teachers and residents at senior facility, senior living facilities, whether it's been generously giving of our resources to help cover people's mortgages and rents and utilities. Many of you this past Friday, you dropped off boxes and boxes of food for a senior living facility in Westmont. Those actions are amazing. Those are acts of love. And I'm so proud of how you, church, are continuing to show the love of Jesus to our community, to our people. But at the end of the day, we have to do it in Jesus' name. At the end of the day, we got to point people to Jesus. At the end of the day, we have to encourage people and talk to them about how Jesus has changed us. You know, the idea of feeding and, and, and caring for sheep is not disjointed from the act of fishing. You can't have fishing without feeding. You can't have feeding without fishing. They have to be together. When we share, we show. When we show, we share. It's Jesus' plan for his church. It's Jesus' mission for you and I. And so what does that look like practically? Let's, let's get a level deeper as we close out our time together. Well, you know, we talked about our family life because we're spending so much time with our immediate family in our homes. And so it looks like showing patience and kindness and grace even when you're frustrated, even when you're discouraged, even when things aren't working out the way they should be at home. And it's in those moments that you point people, your people, to Jesus. <laughs> for, for myself, Nora, Max, my kids... <laughs> You know, I, the, because I'm being forgiving to you in this moment, it's not because I'm this great dad. It's because Jesus has forgiven me first. And I want you to experience the forgiveness that you can have in relationship with Jesus. And maybe for us in, in this time, for parents and families, it's a reminder that the most important thing we can do for our kids is to care about their spiritual growth and their relationship with Jesus, not their schoolwork not their sports and academic achievements, not their future decisions in life, but it's about how they represent the love of Jesus to the world around them. And it's within those different things, like school and sports and conversations with others, that we remind them that, hey, when you're living, you're pointing people to Jesus. You're showing people how much Jesus loves you and loves them. I think about this just for everyone in our social media world right now, where everything, all types of connection is online. We can't be sharing the love of Jesus on a Sunday by sharing this video or sharing our favorite Bible verse or something inspirational. And then Monday, after a 2.30 update from the, the government, we begin to bash government officials or bash scientists that we don't see eye to eye with. We vent and let our frustration come out on social media during those times. We, we can't be doing one thing on Sunday and another thing on Monday because the world around us looks at us and say, hypocrite. Or, or maybe even more so, are you bipolar? <laughs> like, how can something look like this one day and the next day look completely different? That's, we can't share and then not show the love of Jesus. They have to be connected. So I want to end on this for our church as we look to think about how we can show our love for our people that points them to Jesus. We've had this acronym that we've used in the past. It's a word that many of you are familiar with. It's the word bless. And in this word, we've made it into an acronym. Each of those letters stands for a line. And this word we've, we've used to help us shape how we can stay on mission with Jesus daily. And so the first line in that is the line for, for B, which is begin with prayer. Maybe there's someone in your life right now that God has laid on your heart during this message. And every day this week, maybe you need to spend one minute praying for that person. 
Praying that God would give you opportunities to show the love of Christ to them. That God would give you opportunities to have conversation with them. That their heart would be opened to the gospel message. The next one is L, listen with care. And maybe you need to spend time this week instead of venting on social media about what's wrong, listen to others, ask questions to them, see how they are doing. Shoot them a text and ask them, how are you doing? How can I be praying for you? The next one is E, eat with them. (laughs) How do you do that when we're social distancing? Well, as Jesus showed us last week in John chapter 21, the, the purpose behind eating is for conversation, it's for communion, it's for connection. And never before has our world been so easily connected through technology. And so maybe you can't go to Starbucks with them, but maybe you each can have your cup of coffee as you have a Zoom conversation or a FaceTime conversation and just see how they're doing. The next one in the BLESS acronym is the first S, is to serve them, meet a specific need in their life. You know the impact that happens when someone acts lovingly towards you. And so what can you do this week to serve someone? Well, in those conversations that you have with them, you'll be able to figure out what needs can be met in their life. And then the second S is the the last line, is to share your story, to share with them how Jesus has changed you, to share the impact Jesus has made on your life, to share with them the hope that they can have in relationship with Jesus. You know, fishing and feeding, they're not disjointed acts. They have to be connected. And maybe this week your takeaway from here is you need to practice this blessed practice for one person in your life every single day. We'd love to hear the stories later on this week of how God has allowed you to practice these blessed practices. So feel free to shoot us an email, send us a DM, let us know how God is challenging you to show your love in a practical way towards others.